I'll be here for the Delaware County Jail Oversight Board meeting. I'd like everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any public comment on agenda items? Seeing none in the room, none online. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the March 2024 minutes? I make so a motion to approve the March 2024 minutes. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes approved. Um, Sorry. And Ms. Just, O'Malley? Yes. Yeah, just a, a point of order. I think it, um, so first of all, for the public, um, I've asked our vice chair for the Jail Oversight Board, Ms. O'Malley, to, to chair the meeting today in light of the fact that I'm joining virtually. Um, but we, we should probably also make mention of the fact that we did an executive session yesterday. Um, and that executive session covered um, matters related to um, uh, real estate and um, some matters associated with personnel. Thank you very much for mentioning that. I will turn the chairmanship back to you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the reports from March 2024? I'd like to make a motion to approve reports in March 24. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Reports are approved. Okay. Our next agenda item is a report from our warden. Good afternoon, members of the board. Thank you for joining us for today's oversight board meeting and to those that are also joining um, virtually or in the room. And uh, on the agenda, I, I wanted to make a matter of specification. Um, we are starting to pull out some items on the agenda that would be typically enclosed within the warden's report to give the public a better idea of items that will be announced during the warden's report and to provide for an opportunity of public comment should that arise. And Sean will queue up the presentation. You're, you can have as much time as you need. I can start reading some of the statistics from the first page that I typically review. Uh, this morning's current population was 1,209 incarcerated persons in custody, which was an increase from uh, of 19 from last month's meeting. Our weekender program, we had 18 individuals sentenced to weekends. Nine of those 18 were first timers and four were female. We had 547 commitments with 531 discharges. Recreation was largely provided to full block recreation without, with the exception of those that are noted on this slide. And we did have a major incident that might have gained some traction or at least some information over the radios if anybody listens to dispatch. Um, last month in March on the 13th, uh, Wednesday, we actually hosted a mass disaster drill at the facility grounds. And we coordinated with multiple community jurisdictions as well as emergency response providers. Uh, the purpose and intention of a mass disaster drill is to overwhelm the staff that we have on site, meaning that we need to require and coordinate with outside entities and do a tabletop exercise with them. Uh, following the event, we also had a debriefing session with the agencies that were involved, and uh, we learned a great deal from the response effort, uh, as well as reinforced the actions of our staff and their awareness of policies and procedures. Monthly statistics. So we, we have not seen any real significant changes in trends. We remain a largely male populated facility of adults uh, with the large majority of those being free trial and unsentenced. Our age population trends you can see in the left quadrant, uh, we have not really changed again uh, or deviated. It is largely those that fall within the age range of 25 to 34 that make up the majority of the population. In terms of our new commitment data, and I feel compelled to report because not every agency in Delaware County has the opportunity or the privilege to make 
public reports as the jail does. Uh, but there is a lot of work that is happening with many different criminal justice agencies that is done. And the president judge uh, hosted a meeting that happened with probation as well as county leadership and jail, uh, jail administration to review the commitment data that is shared every single month uh, to make sure that we were sharing information and to identify different areas in which we can strengthen our reporting measures. So you're going to see a little bit of change within the uh, information that's provided. Our new commitment data showed that 142 individuals were originally committed on a VOP. Uh, we did change that number to be 134 as we, we identified with the sentencing paperwork with the commitment documents that four of those were misclassified and related to pretrial or bail warrants. Three were under state supervision parole, and one was second chance court related. Um, our original calculation was the 142, but with those adjustments, you see a reflection of 134. So those that are related to probation uh, in their commitments is approximately 25% of the population. When you break down that violation category even more specifically, 89 out of the 134 or 66 percent of all violations are related to technical violations, with the largest majority being individuals who have absconded and they have not been participating or reporting in their probation, which is a term and condition of that sentencing. 62 percent within the month of March were related to failure to appear bench warrants and 45 were violations of probations with additional charges or new cases. You can also see in the bottom of the graph, the lead commitment reason. So the largest category you do see is still related to violations that we've broken that down further. And the others that you can see are aggravated assault, arrest prior to requisition, DUI, firearms and weapons, FTA or failure to appear warrants, possession or drug-related paraphernalia charges, receiving stolen property, retail theft, simple assault. In terms of behavioral health statistics, you can see the range from each month. Again, we're staying pretty uh, stable in our numbers. There are no real significant deviations, uh, though we did see a slight increase in those with serious mental illness, as well as those that are prescribed psychiatric medications. for restoration of competency. And I'd hoped that I would have a matter or a member of WellPath today for their presentation, but unfortunately we just underwent a staffing change. Um, and so we had made this commitment because I think there's a lot of work to be celebrated. Uh, some of the individuals that you see on this slide are not working with the agency. They are doing other work within the community and remaining committed to patient care. Um, so we are gonna be evolving and adapting once again for this program that's still within its first year at George W. Hill. Sure. Can I interrupt with a question? So so actually the, back to the, the probation statistics of failure to appear. Um, so those failure to appears are, and, and I'm only speaking from my experience, are long-term years of failure. Sometimes there are years of failure to appear and people are picked up. Not, I don't want people to think that they miss an appointment and they get picked up because that is not, not accurate. It, it is really failure to appear. We're talking over not, not just months, but sometimes years of not appearing. Yes. So I think one of the opportunities that we all have is we can't control what people think or feel, uh, nope. but we can provide an opportunity for education. So I, I don't know if everybody was able to hear, because I don't know if I'm hearing you just because I'm standing next to you nope. or if the microphone is on. Nope. Um, you but Judge Amorosa was talking about failure to appear and how long somebody might have uh, to comply with the expectations stipulated by the courts before a warrant is issued. And so it could be a very wide range and variety. We do not track the amount of time that somebody had absconded or did not appear. Um, we just know that they do come in on that bench warrant violation. Um, and before we leave that point, and I, I appreciate the, the judge uh, making that clarification, I, I also wanna add my thanks to the president judge and to um, the probation department and specifically 
director Hibbard for um, the sit down. I, Cause I think, you know, I, I think it, it is a matter of public interest to understand what taxpayer money is going toward in terms of who is being incarcerated and who isn't. Um, but I think it's, you know, in that line, I think it's more important that we really fully understand what, you know, what might be a very large bucket, what's really in there. And so I, I appreciate um, the the willingness, the desire to um, be collaborative in sharing what information we have so that we, the members of the Jail Oversight Board, we county council and the larger public, um, they really do understand what's what was in that, you know, fairly large, um, but up to here um, without much detailed number. I'd just like to add that um, this this whole conversation on this topic has been really beneficial to me on the board, and I thank Judge Amoroso for really pushing it, and, and the warden and staff for collecting this data, because the idea that we can have this discussion now is light years from where we started on, you know, on, on this journey. So it really is helpful to know, and if, you, if anyone goes back and looks at audits, even from the magisterial district courts and understands what pressures they're under to issue warrants, yeah. um, it, it's there's a whole circle circle here too. So um, it's it's been really valuable. So I echo um, Councilman Madden's uh, comments, but I do thank bo both of you for all this. And the other thing I'd just like to add, I mean, the, the, the ward mentioned that the population in general has been fairly stable. And that's true, I think, when you're talking about the last year and a half or so. But when we zoom out, I think it's worth reminding folks who are newer to the program um, that when we look at this number from pre-2020, when we look at 2019, 2018 and prior, the jail population was more in the range of 1,800. So it has come down by roughly a third in the last four years. So uh, it's hard to necessarily pinpoint the exact whys, but clearly um, there have been changes in um, the makeup of the incarcerated population. And I want to, you know, I, I attribute that uh, to, to some extent to the collaborative efforts of all the stakeholders within criminal justice. Thank you. Uh, so within restoration of competency, and I want to break down some of the numbers because they may seem confusing. Uh, when we initially set out to have this contract amendment with WellPath, we had talked about five individuals being engaged in services. And what we're seeing is that A, the demand and the need need is far beyond that. Um, and that B, when you have committed staff who are ethical and who want to do the right things and advocate for the client and make sure that continuity of care happens, you're always going to see a, a larger reach and touch for the, the clinical contacts. We have five individuals who are engaged in full services, and those are the ones stipulated by the court to be ordered for a restoration of competency treatment. Some of those individuals may still require transfer to Norristown State Hospital. Others, it is our hope that they will be able to be restored to competency in jail-based services and then navigate their criminal justice proceedings. So we have five clients in full enrollment, two that are in competency maintenance group clients. So two persons who have already completed Norristown, they've not fulfilled their adjudication process. We do not wanna see a regression of behavior. And so they're still actively participating in group services and contributing to that therapeutic milieu. We have seven individuals who are being followed very closely by psychiatry to make sure that they too are maintaining medication compliance, which has contributed to their overall health and stability. In the month of March, we had three new admissions to the program, one discharge after successful completion after they were deemed to have been restored to competency based on a forensic evaluation that occurred on the 29th of February. So they were officially discharged from that program with the courts engaged uh, within that uh, process as of March 11th. To break down the clinical con contacts, uh, we have not a large volume of staff that are dedicated to this work. We have a full-time mental health professional, uh, a full-time psychologist, a part-time psychiatrist, and a part-time administrative assistant. 
And so group sessions, there were 28 that were held. Again, those are those five to seven that we have engaged within the program. Um, there are individual mental health contacts, which could include daily check-ins, which are five to 10 minutes. They're brief, intermittent, addressing the immediate need, making sure that they're stable um, and that they're going to come and participate in group services. And then weekly individual sessions that are one-on-one -on -one basis and they're more in-depth. Uh, those are 15 to 50 minutes. They're also doing additional screening contacts to determine the eligibility or the level of participation within the jail-based program or if they would be best served at Norristown. Um, discharge contacts, psychiatric assessments, and follow-ups, of which there have to be many. Uh, constant reinforcement and consistency is extremely important. So what is competency restoration? Well, it's focusing on participants' factual and rational understanding of legal proceedings using the following different modalities or mechanisms. Didactic instruction, which is a very formal way of saying that somebody uh, provides structured lessons, uh, like a teacher-student relationship uh, in a lecture-style format. We do vignette discussions, and we've referenced that with case manager Michael Hennigan, who's additionally participated in some of those discussions related to cases or role plays. Uh, worksheets and writing activities, competency crosswords or word searches, many of which are developed by our on-site team to be specific to tailoring the needs of those that are engaged in program and competency activities, a lot of which requires you to use executive function as well as some gross motor functions so that we're activating a number of different um, mechanisms and, and really solidifying the information. Uh, they provide psychoeducation, uh, and that is done in a number of different ways. So I've provided some of the examples that the program staff has given to me, as well as the milieu, which is focusing on strengthening the group alliance. And this has been one of the more important investments um, as we've seen individuals engage and really respond to the services. They're having those discussions with their peers and getting people to engage even further. Um, so we are really impressed and appreciate the services that are being offered while also understanding that there are likely a number of different opportunities, including addressing some of the challenges that working in corrections simply has. Um, I, I know that I say this probably too frequently. We are a correctional setting first, and, and a lot of times we're attempting to do what hospitals are required to do and provide treatment and services and programs, which sometimes competes with the many different challenges of a correctional environment, um, getting meals, getting medications, recreation, services. Uh, it is not easy and it's done with staff that are dedicated to make those missions happen every single day. For medication- Gordon, before we, sorry, before we, we leave the topic of the restoration of competency program, um, I want to mention, and I think that um, Ms. O'Malley was likely to do so later on in the meeting anyway, um, we did have one of our, uh, you know, unscheduled, um, but semi-annual um, unannounced visits to the, to the jail by members of the Jail Oversight Board this past week. And, um, you know, as always, I think these, these visits are, are very helpful for all of us in getting a, um, a, a more granular understanding of, of what um, is going on. And um, certainly they're not the only times that we're there, but I think they're in a more formal fashion um, laid out in a way that's, that's pretty useful. Um, and a, a few of us did spend some time um, speaking a bit more about the restoration of competency program. And, and I think this little deep dive that you did, Warden, I think is really helpful in understanding, you know, people hear it in the abstract of what an uh, RSC program is, but um, to really understand what the day-to-day -day actual occurrences are that restore someone's competency or attempts to, um, I think this is really helpful. Um, you know, I, I think it's always important to caveat the um, observations of a uh, of a visit to realize that they are anecdotal and you can speak with one person and get a very different perspective than you might if you spoke with someone else. So that's an important caveat. Um, and I think also what you just said is, is really important to understand. Um, these sorts of programs typically aren't happening in a correction setting and, and there are certain um, pragmatic 
challenges associated with first and foremost being a corrections institution and, and all the necessary security and protocols that have to occur. Um, but I think what some of the takeaways was that, you know, look, this is a work in progress, that this is a fairly early program. Um, every time that we see a graduate, like we did this past month, that's one more person who's been able to proceed through the criminal justice system that much faster and not have to wait for an opening at one of the two statewide locations. So that's a success and that's, that's making an impact on an individual and that's important to remember. Um, but I think again, with any early stage program, the takeaway I think that we got was that, you know, from a staffing perspective, from a protocols perspective, there's still probably, you know, a continuous improvement that needs to occur. And um, I, I'm sure that no doubt you would probably agree with that word in, in light of some of the comments you just made. But um, once again, I'm really glad that we have made this investment and I hope that we can continue to improve it and that it can be a model perhaps for other um, county facilities around the state who also are challenged by the um, limited um, capacity that the two statewide facilities have. Thank you very much. And I, I would agree. I think that continuous improvement sometimes isn't always highlighted as being a real strength. Um, this is still within its first year. And this is something that we have to constantly be willing to be defense less instead of defensive and be willing to examine what is successful and what is not. Um, I struggle to say that publicly because I never want it to be implied or detract from the staff that is doing the work and really dedicating themselves to working through all of the different pre procedural challenges that we face. And so I think that we've learned a great deal over the last couple of months, and we still have many lessons to be learned, uh, but that is not at the detriment um, or to detract or dismiss any of the work that's already been invested by those really addressing these challenges each day. For medications for opioid use disorder, and this is another area where we could say continuous quality improvement has allowed us to further examine and expand services. Uh, this month, we have 155, which to date is the highest number of participants at any single time for medications for opioid disorder. You can see the breakdown of those with buprenorphine, sublocate, and methadone that are being served. Um, we're also continuing to track those that are continued versus those that are inducted into services. And we are excited to see that we are meeting some of the needs of the population, though, and I think it could be um, also championed in the same way that uh, Councilman Madden provided comments related to the most recent visit that there's still a need. Uh, there are still patients who are on a wait list who are looking to get engaged in services moving forward forward. And so we remain committed to that. Uh, there will need to be additional investments in staffing as we continue to expand those program services. Yeah. And, and similarly to pause there, I, I want to, you know, in the interest of expediency, I think everything you just said and, and everything that I previously said around the restoration of the competency program, I think applies here. It, it does sound like it's, you know, it's a program that's grown so much in such a short period of time. And Unfortunately, it is growing because there's still uh, an unmet need for people who suffer from opioid use disorder and are in an incarcerated setting where, you know, there is this opportunity for intervention and absent it, you have people who leave jail and have not gotten the necessary treatment and are re-exposed with an immune system that has been uh, reduced. And um, as we know so often, um, that leads to a fatal overdose uh, at, at levels that are multiples higher than any other circumstance, that, that sort of critical period post um, leaving jail. Um, so it's so important that we've made this investment. But like you said, I, I think the takeaway was, you know, it, it's, it's tough to staff. And um, as the program has grown, I think it's important that we make sure that we do all we can to really um, staff it up and give the people who are committing their energies to such an important um, program that we give them the support that's necessary. I mean, we, we have um, a, a real opportunity with the settlement dollars from the uh, opioids lawsuits 
to invest that in areas that are critical. And I think this, you know, I, to me, it's right near the top of the list of, of ways that we can really make those dollars go a long way is to invest here. Um, and I, I also just want to give a shout out. I think what we heard in spades during our visit, and it's again, not the first time is that um, our director of that program, um, he, he gets um, some real appreciation from those who are working with him. Um, they, they seem to not seem they, they were universally appreciative of, of what he's been able to offer um, in the time that they work together. So a shout out to our director there. Thank you for your work in, in helping all our folks in Delaware County. And that's a shout out specifically for Demetrius. And I think that um, what was shared post visit was that uh, overwhelmingly people just want more services, uh, not necessarily more medication. That's not what it was. It was more group, more individual contacts, more discharge planning, more working towards uh, their recovery goals. And, and so I appreciate um, when the board does come to visit uh, because you guys have the capacity uh, to provide that oversight. People want to speak to you. They want to give you information so that you can evaluate it. And we can all use that as a way to progress and move forward. And it's wonderful when staff do get highlighted for their successes. Uh, you can see in the lower left quadrant on the 15th of March, we had a graduate graduation at the facility and Judge Love uh, pre presided over the uh, administration of the oath. Uh, we began a class on March 4th and those individuals are scheduled to graduate this Friday on the 12th. And we are um, actively recruiting for an additional class to start at the end of this month. So April is a strange month in which we started a class on the 1st and we'll start another one on the 29th. We also hosted a field training officer training and that occurred on the 3rd of April. You can see in the picture that those are the individuals who completed the additional training and a field training officer is somebody who volunteers. They're an employee in good standing uh, and they recognize that they want to be able to support and develop their peers. And so they take on additional leadership attributes and they help guide individuals through policies, procedures, the performance of their duties. Um, and we were very excited to have these individuals who are involved. So I have the left to right underneath the caption of the photo, um, but Officer Saduki represented first shift. We had quite a bit from second shift. Um, so Officer Catunio, Officer Jackson, Officer Jones, Officer Artis, Officer Rivera, and for third shift, and you guys might recognize uh, he was employee of the month last month, Officer Sadiq as well. On the 23rd of March, we hosted a partnership with Delaware County Park Police. And so we are still extending the Apex virtual reality system to other county departments. Uh, we are so fortunate that the Jail Oversight Board and County Council supported our agency and being the ones to procure this uh, training device and that we've been able to share it with both the Sheriff's Department as well as Park Police. And so we are very hopeful that we'll continue those efforts moving forward forward. Um, this was done under the instruction of Damon Lodeholt, who is one of our instructors within the Basic Training Academy. He is certified by the State Department of Corrections. He's a train the trainer, uh, and he has done quite a bit of work in discovery and getting close to the APEC system, which assists us in de-escalation strategies and reinforcing best practices in response. Our employees of the month, we're excited to announce and celebrate Michael Hennigan, case manager, and he's on the left with his supervisors, John Swider and Deputy Warden Valley. Uh, Jessica Carrar, who is a mental health coordinator within the facility, she actually started as one of our RTC employees and she expanded her role into the foundational mental health practices within the agency. And Sergeant Andrew Matola, who is on the right with uh, Lieutenant Jared McCafferty. We are still seeking additional employees. And so I would encourage anybody who is listening to go uh, navigate to the website to be able to apply online or to direct somebody that you know who is looking for uh, county employment. We are hosting in this calendar month, uh, our very first incarcerated person job fair. And so we are very excited in partnership with EDSI um, and largely coordinated by on-site staff. Uh, um, that we are going to host an opportunity for employers who would be interested 
in providing employment to persons upon release. And so we have 19 different service providers that are registered and approved and expected to attend. They'll be able to meet with individuals who could be future applicants, talk about um, their resume building exercises, do role play interviews, get more information, help build confidence and allow people to understand that there are employees that are out there that are interested in providing opportunities. Um, this concept was actually developed and modified after one of our employees, and it was our workforce and education administrator, Joan Skirsky, attended the SCI Chester job fair. So the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections has hosted this before. I'm sure other county agencies have, but we hadn't. And so after she had attended and saw what opportunities existed, uh, she wanted to bring it in. And with the support of Deputy Warden Valley and many other program staff, we're going to be arriving at our very first one next week um, at the facility. So we remain committed, and I know it's a topic of discussion, of identifying areas to reduce recidivism, which is a bit of an, an, you know, an abstract concept because it is so many different factors that can be complex and can contribute. And depending on what study you look at, it'll tell you that education level is one of of the biggest predictors of recidivism or that mental health diagnosis or substance use disorder or stable living situation or job readiness and employability. And so we are working towards providing a number of different either services or programs that work to directly address those manners very specifically. Um, anything that we can do to reduce risk and increase success opportunities for the population is something that we are committed to do. And so while I don't want to say that we're going to research this, we are going to see what the level of efficacy of these programs are. Um, we It's too soon to tell because recidivism usually is gauged at different points post-release, six months, one year three years, uh, and we just don't know yet, uh, but we'll continue to have these conversations. We will continue to push the limit to be humble and to recognize that not everything that we do is gonna be exactly right in our first attempt, but um, it's amazing to see how innovative and um, dedicated staff are to trying something new. It is also really helpful to have the amount of community engagement um, and board engagement and supporting these initiatives to make them truly successful. Warden, if I could once again interrupt your your flow here, um, I, I think it's uh, you know again it's it's these little milestones that we need to recognize. And as you alluded to, um, combating recidivism isn't something where there's a silver bullet. There isn't one thing that we will do or any facility is going to do to suddenly um, reduce recidivism by a significant number. It's going to be all of these little pieces. It's, it's providing, you know, the necessary treatment for people with opioids use disorder. It's, you know, helping on the mental health front. Um, it's providing, you know, those, ba you know, it's, it's our, uh, um, uh, what's the the program for um high school equivalency I, i'm just drawing a silly blank on the the, uh, the gre um you know it, it's these little programs not little but these these programs that help in um helping an individual and and making that individual turn into a slightly smaller statistic right and i think this job fair um is a real important milestone and I hope it it's successful. I hope that we can build upon it and bring in even more um, employers from the outside who in a tight job market, um, they are looking for ways to say, look, um, just because you have um, a record, that doesn't mean you can't be a, a good employee going forward. I think it's really important that we have these. So um, I want to thank the staff. I want to thank, our administrator, uh, Joan, for um, her leadership in making this occur. And uh, I look forward to seeing how things go on the April 17th. We hope to have some photos next month, so we'll be sure to give an update as well. Wonderful. This is our cost recovery slide that we typically have just so that information is known of what is collected 
connected uh, each month. We do now have some asks um, that I'll be moving towards after some final kind of notifications and then board action, none of which are any expenditure requests this month. So capital improvement and projects, and we these uh, this slide is identifying those that are current or in progress or soon to be finished, and so we have two. Domestic hot water, which actually started construction in the 2023 calendar year, uh, is working towards closeout, and we're in, when they're in this final phase. Uh, the final phasing includes adjustments and resolution to operational issues that were discovered after the installation of materials of the new boilers and installation of a new water softener system to mitigate future erosion and, and corrosion. And that's very important that that's taking place. Our projected closeout date is the end of this calendar month, April 30th of 2024. Paving of roads, uh, we have, you know, this is an initiative that's supported by Public Works, though it is funded by the county, um, many county roads have received necessary maintenance and repaving. And again, last calendar year in 2023, we were one of those designated sites. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to complete all of the work in one fell swoop because, again, it also has to be phased. We need to make sure that we're not disrupting to operations, and then the weather conditions turned unfavorable. So as the weather conditions are breaking, and today is beautiful out, um, we hope that we'll be able to complete the next phase of the paving, which will be um, part of our towards the training department area in April or May of 2024. It will be weather, weather dependent and construction um, work uh, dependent on their calendar. For advancing projects, and some of these items are going to be systemically going to, or systematically, I should say, going to county council for contract approval. And so the, the action I would ask of the board following the completion of this slide is whether or not there is continued support from the jail oversight board to continue these actions in accordance with all county procurement processes and stipulated rules by the home rule charter. And we have the roof replacement of the administration building. This uh, contract for the design build was approved by County Council on March 6th at that meeting. The contract is currently in progress with Tremco and WTI. We are having extensive meetings uh, with them to prepare for the work. When the contract is executed, work will be permitted to begin and the anticipated target uh, for construction to start is May of 24. The roof repair and HVAC replacement of the secure facility. Um, we've already identified the HVAC units are at end of life. Uh, though the roofs are also not in great condition, they are repairable instead of needing a full replacement, which is ideal. Uh, meetings have begun for planning and preparation, and we are working to secure, secure contracts for purchase of materials. The lead time for materials is still really long and extensive. That has not rebounded fully from the pandemic. And so construction is not anticipated to start until 2025, and that is directly related to the lead times of those materials. The electronic security and surveillance project, which we've also talked about previously, the construction management firm BSI has been identified and a draft contract is under review with both the county as well as BSI. Future tasks are to review drawings, complete a constructability review, finalize an independent cost estimate and advertise or bid the project. And we are anticipating construction to begin from 24 until 26, we hope to be completed. Within that, we will have embedded a kitchen renovation also managed by BSI, our construction management firm. Once the contract is ex executed with them, they will complete a review of the schematic design drawings and the new schedule will be developed based on those drawings with a tentative start in 25 with project completion by 26. And so to that, I would put to the board um, for continued support that has been previously offered so that we can maintain timelines with procurement processes with county council. Okay, would someone like to make a motion to continue the capital improvements and project plan as described by the warden in accordance with their timeline and all procurement policies and procedures of the state of Pennsylvania and county of Delaware? I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Uh, before, sorry, before we uh, go to the vote, I just uh, some questions.
question in the comments. Um, Sorry. And I, I think I don't really have any questions, um, but I do have a comment and it's a bit repetitive with what uh, I've probably said in the past, but given the investments in the infrastructure, just how significant thematically this investment is and the works that are happening over the next couple of years, I think it's important to keep going back to it. Um, we are asking our staff to be patient. And that's something that's big to ask that, you know, they are working under conditions that are challenged by the fact that um, we have an infrastructure that in many cases is, you know, has been stretched beyond its typical lifetime um, in some, in some respects. And um, for the perspective of inmates who are in our custody, um, these investments will um, improve their uh, the experience of being there in, in ways that are important. So um, it is really important to remember again that th this is a very significant. I think over the the total of these projects, we're talking about forty million dollars, which is um, more than has been invested in this facility over the entire 25 year period um, since its construction in 1998. Um, so unfortunately, this isn't the sort of thing where you wave a magic wand and all these things are complete, but it's important that we keep these um, moving forward as expediently as possible. And where there are opportunities to tighten these timelines and, and move up um, completion dates, I, I hope we'll continue to, to look for such opportunities. I have one comment too that I've made before, and just to be clear for the public's public that are watching, and for just a reminder to us that um, these improvements that are needed and were needed were always county obligations. They were not covered under the contract with the private um, you know, provider, so it wasn't something. It was just they were just not done, and we need to do them. So it's just something to be clear. It's not something that um, was happening along the way. It just wasn't happening at all, and no one had that obligation except the county. So it's just a long time coming. And you know, if you don't fix the roof and things, the water gets in and destroys things. So I, I'm totally supportive of getting this done as best we can and with the most efficient and economically as possible. So. Um, but I think it's important to remember that. I would just like to make a comment that um, Joanne, to follow up with Joanne said, uh, she is our financial guru for this committee. So if she's supporting it, then I could totally support it. <laughs> Happy burden now. Any other board comments? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. So I have some more board action. There's two more items uh, that I need some uh, support or determination on. And so the first one is a Delaware County impound lot survey. And so this is an item that is not uh, driven by George W. Hill, but impacts George W. Hill. So Delaware County has an impound lot and they've identified a need to locate and survey a space to accommodate a county impound lot due to capital improvement needs at the present location that will no longer sustain a county impound lot happening at that present location. Uh, due to the landmass value of county property at the site of George W. Hill Correctional Facility, uh, it has been identified that this is a potential area in which an impound lot could take place. The site still needs to be surveyed to determine feasibility. But in order for that action to even take place, uh, county council would need to engage or execute a contract with a qualified vendor who could complete that feasibility study. The Department of Public Works is seeking support to execute that contract, and they would like to go to County Council uh, to see whether or not we could be considered as an option. Uh, should the land, land mass study be deemed viable based on the feasibility study, additional discussion would still need to occur due to the perceived impact of facility operations. So completing this study or survey does not mean that we would be supporting its actual designation 
nation or location happening at George W. Hill Correctional Facility. That could be something that is arrived at in the future as a conclusion, but this current action item is just for Public Works to be able to address council to determine whether or not we should be considered for a land survey study. And so that is to the board for your um, deliberation and determination. I'd like to uh, ask for a motion for a feasibility survey for an impound lot on the George W. Hill property. I'll make the motion. Second. Second. Okay. Any board? So, yes, I yeah. Will. As well. Okay, Mr. Yeah, um, I would like to know more about it. Um, especially the part of um, I guess doing an investigatory part. I know this is just a part to do the research on it. And like again, like I said a couple of months ago, um, I, I think the board should be informed about these kind of decisions when it comes to um I, I guess this would be like a business partnership with the with the prison. Am I correct? Essentially, yes. Yes. I would like to know more about it myself mm -hmm. personally um, so we can know kind of like all of the details of what we might be getting ourselves into. I'm thinking about liability. I'm thinking about, you know, um, our people who are residents inside the prison. Will they be working there? All these kind of things, right? Um, I just need to know more. Mr. King, if I could just jump in, um, as you alluded to, there are security implications. There are uh, obviously real estate implications. And this was actually a topic that I alluded to in the executive session we had yesterday. And I realized you couldn't make yesterday's executive session, but we, we did go into great detail talking about some of those concerns um, in a, you know, in a format that was appropriate given the security elements to it. Um, so just FYI, there, there was more discussion. Um, but as you said, I think this is purely around a survey to occur, and this wouldn't be um, expressing support or not support for actually it's being located here. Um, for my part, I would say that um, I wear a couple different hats, and I think the, the hat of a jail oversight board member, I too would want to ensure that um, – to sort of piggyback off of the previous topic, we have a lot that's going on from a capital projects perspective over the next couple of years. And I do have some concerns that we ensure that if this were placed at the property, that it would do so in a way, in addition to making sure from a security perspective, we were covered, but that also that um, it doesn't conflict with all the, the, the necessary and urgently necessary projects that we will have over the next couple of years. Um, but then wearing my county council hat, and, or frankly, either hat, I think it's important that we um, be good partners, this facility be good partners within the overall context of the needs of Delaware County. And um, I think we have to have an open mind if ultimately um, it appears that this is far and away the, the best place for um, the, the location to um, be for the impound lot then I think it has to be considered if it is in fact ultimately deemed viable through this survey. Um, so with that, I, I certainly uh, support um, at least going through the process of doing a survey to see if it's viable or not. And we can have more conversation about ultimately if it is deemed viable, whether this is the right place. Thank you. I, I too have a concerns about burdening the, the jail with any further capital improvement project or um, security project or staffing issue later. So um, I think you know, if we do the feasibility study, that I'm not really opposed to. However, it would be good to know if there were other locations being considered for feasibility as well. Um, and I know that may be something for council or public works to take up. I would say that ultimately, if it is the best place, I can't say that I necessarily would support it, not that it, County Council will have the option to do what it wishes to do. So I just want to make sure there's no further burden to the facility, especially in terms of its bu of the budget, and ultimately may maybe some kind of cost sharing would have to come in play if there is a burden. Um, 
So I, I, I hear that for the feasibility, I understand the need. I, I wish, uh, you know, I, I express that I, I do have concerns like Mr. King and, and Mr. Madden as well. So, um, but you know, that's where I stand today. Um, I know on my end is just, you know, I think it's really important to get the feedback and the, from the frontline workers, you know, at George W. Hill of how this could affect and, um, you know, what the opinion is. And I know it was discussed yesterday. I just think it's really important that when decisions are made um, at the county jail, that those running the county jail, you know, have a voice for that. And if there's issues with, um, you know, staffing or safety or, you know, whatever, just resources being expended, you know, to really keep that in mind and, um, you know, to, to really um, ensure that feedback back from the warden and the staff at George W. Hill is weighed, you know, very heavily on whatever decision is made here. Cause I think that's very important since they're there on a daily basis to frontline workers and they know, um, you know, all that's going on, all these projects are happening and the, the scarce resources and staffing that currently exists. And if this, you know, relies on any additional, the concerns for that, you know, just coming off that inspection, that's always, you know, the main thing is, you know, more staff, more resources. So definitely don't want to utilize it for something that isn't specifically um, designed for things that we're missing in the jail currently. So um, that's where I would stand on it. I just don't want to hold anything up if, you know, if it's ultimately something that's not supported later down the line, um, you know, if it's, oh, do the survey, but we don't support or do the survey because we support. So I just want to be, you know, realistic with things like that as well. But that's my feedback is, you know, I really would um, vote on the side of the staff at George W. Hill of what their feedback is on the project. Although I second the motion, it clearly was a motion for the feasibility study and a lot of the concerns that my fellow board members just posed, I agree with. But again, uh, at this time, I believe it's a feasibility study. And again, I would support looking at other options throughout the county. Yeah, I had a question about the feasibility study. Um, I might sound ignorant, right? Um, but is that a cost to the county, the people of Delaware? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I know I missed the executive meeting yesterday, and I'm just thinking about these things because I, I think the first priority are the residents and the employees at George Hill Correctional Facility. For me, when I'm thinking about these kind of things, um, you know, when, when other people are coming on properties, there are so many different opportunities. Um, like I said, liability, escape. Um, people being related to people that we don't even know. There's so, there are just so many things. I just think it's it's too early for me. I just think it's too early to consider something like this at this point. I understand bringing it up, and it's and I really appreciate the opportunity of trying to see the county slash and maybe the prison um, to make some money. I, I get that, um, but I just think it's too early to um, consider a project like this being that we're under a construction of, of maintenance for $40 million. And, and to me, I'm, I'm just thinking about that. I'm always thinking down the road. And that's just my personal opinion. I, I feel like if we're going to spend the county's money and the people's money, um, we're talking about a project that might not even get done until three, four, five years down the line. What would it look like if that lot got built before we can complete it, right? The structure, the, the construction of the prison. I just don't think it's fair um, to the people at at the prison, um, the employees and the residents. I just think it would be a, an intelligent move um, to use all our money and resources towards the rehabilitation of the prison so it can be better for both the staff and the residents. But it's not coming out of the jail's budget. So I, I did want to provide it's, it's, some points of clarity right. that the, the request is coming from the Department of Public Works, but because it potentially potentially impacts or will take place on the property is an appropriate level of discussion for the jail oversight board. So it will not be uh, coming from our budget. 
for any element of this un unless we were to move forward and actually support this being built or constructed on the property. Uh, it is our belief that there would be implications that would be impacted by the jail budget, which is a separate conversation. Um, I, I don't know the exact timeline, but I do know that there are committed capital improvement projects already occurring at the area or site in which the impact how lot exists. So the timeline is additionally aggressive to find an alternate space. And so this would likely be something that would be happening if it was agreed to in the feasibility study, um, identified it as a viable option within the next couple of months to a year that it would need to start um, for the actual work to be completed. Though so the Department of Public Works is the expert and entity that uh, would have that I am also not aware, and it's not to suggest that it hasn't happened, if there has been any other site that has been looked at, considered, or surveyed for this work. And so I don't know if we are the best, last, and final option, or if we are a, an easy um, idea because of the land mass value. And so any of those things could be true, um, but our action, and I would agree, if we, if we are deemed a viable site, there is still a great deal of discussion that needs to take place. Um, but we did talk, and, and I think this could be said um, publicly, there are a lot of challenges that the county has in general to manage a multitude of departments and to provide services that are required for public safety or human services. And there is a lot of not in my backyard is what is referenced. And I think that the county has struggled to identify areas to have different sites to provide the services that the county endeavors to provide. And while I have an enormous amount of um, reservation without further discussion, and I would not want to be head fast or head strong into any of these decisions, um, I technically don't own the land, the county does. Um, and, and what I have to do as Mr. Corson indicated is assert my subject matter expertise um, and you do that in concert with the large volume of staff that has an enormous amount of knowledge and experience, um, and that we should be able to have the point to be vocal about what we believe to be in the best interest of the agency for consideration. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that um, this, this item, um, I want to give credit to Public Works and County Council for holding off on this until this board could could talk about it. And I also want to say I will su I support the feasibility because I, I I think the fact that we have this in front of us, it gives us the opportunity to put forth the concerns of the jail oversight board and the prison. So if, if it turns out that this is a good location, I think it's clear that these considerations will have to take um, some precedence and importance. And um, I think we have to use all the county resources best we can and balance all the different departments. So, you know, with with my reservations, I, I say it, but I think ultimately there can be solutions for everything. Um, and this this was the first step. And I, I do thank um, Director Floyd for pulling it off the agenda and, and holding it till we can meet today and, and discuss, discuss it, because I think it's appropriate for the board to consider it. Yeah, I, I don't, I'll just only add to that. I, I think um, if the survey is ultimately supported by the Jail Oversight Board here, um, I, I think it's being done so with a very clear on record message from many, if not all of us, that uh, for ultimately support of if feasible feasibility study shows that it is a feasible location, I think what's going to be clear is that actually locating it at the jail or at the property surrounding the jail um, would only occur with this jail oversight board's approval if we all feel su sufficiently comfortable that um, moving forward with it would not sacrifice the timeline of these other important capital projects that are occurring there and that other locations um, have been fully explored as well. And, and you know, only this place, uh, this location is deemed to be far and away where it needs to occur. If there's no other comment, all in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay, final ask. Uh, we have a phone or communication contract, and that has been discussed in other uh, meetings as we reference tablet services uh, within the institution. And the phone tablet vendor is presently Viapath, formerly a company known as Global Telink, GTL. Um, and they were awarded the initial contract for inmate communications in 2009. Uh, over the years, the contract has been amended to support services within the agency. The most recent contract extension and amendment occurred in 2022, which was right before actually the, um, the transition of the county assuming full operations of the agency. Uh, that contract expires at the end of this calendar year. And so it is important to us that we comply with county procurement processes, that we do not execute amendments, that we go to competitive bidding, uh, and that we advertise to do so. It is very possible, and we would welcome the current vendor to apply, but we would also welcome other qualified vendors to apply because that will allow us to truly evaluate all of the services that are offered, the mechanisms in which they're offered, the sustainability of those options, and of course, the cost of what that would be. And so with Jail Oversight Board support, this request to advertise, to do an RFP solicitation would need to be brought to County Council. And so we are asking the board to support our capacity to uh, request permission from the county to advertise this uh, large contract. So we have a motion to advertise for a communications contract for incarcerated persons at the facility. Make a motion. Second. Any board comment? All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Thank you very much. Um, as Were always, any, I was going to say. There any, I just want to make sure it was unanimous. Were there any opposed? No opposed votes. No. Um, if there are any immediate questions, I'm happy to answer those, though I won't go anywhere. I'll wait until the conclusion of the presentation. Um, and so I can invite Deputy Warden Valley to the podium, as and and I'm sure he'll be inviting our Administrator Kelly Shaw as well. Thank you, Warden. Good evening, um, Chair Oversight Board members and uh, people in the public and uh, online. This is the uh, quarterly review for uh, the last three months uh, for under the Department of Treatment and uh, and Programs. Um, this quarter, the month of February, our education workforce development accomplished the highest uh, certification. They graduated 17 IP with a GD for the month of February. This is a very, very great a landmark for um, for Joan Skorsky, her team, and the academy instructors. Um, the average passing rate of GED in our facility is 70%, which is extremely high. Uh, we, and this is a dedication for our educators. During this, this quarter, we also graduated a, uh, a third quarter of the fatherhood program on March 18th. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Keenan from the Delaware County Foundation and Dr. O. Our first quarter for case management. Case management has been very short staff, and I want to thank all the case managers for conducting case manager service delivery. We provided 3,593 case managers service delivery to our incarcerated population. We actually have one uh, case manager over here that is uh, in attendance. Um, I would like to welcome on board two new case manager, case manager Collins and case manager Dixon. Um, they also facilitated the, uh, they currently facilitate the uh, primary election. Um, and thanks to the collaboration with the adult, the, the Over County League of Women's Voters who provided us a uh, training link. And we have the, um, uh, the templates and the form from the um, Delaware County Board of Election. They also facilitate um, the donation card that uh, uh, Mr. King provided to the Muslim population um, for edit, which is uh, going to be tomorrow because tomorrow is the end of Ramadan. Speaking of Ramadan, um, Ramadan began on March 10th and ends on April, uh, ends tonight. Um, we had 174 participants that are seeing Ramadan this year. Um, during this quarter, we also did Ash Wednesday for the first time on February 14th. Thank you so much for um, Reverend Chaplin and collaboration with uh, 
uh, St. Mary's and uh, St. Thomas of Apostle for providing us as a, um, the service delivery. The majority of Protestant, we have 61% of our population who are Protestant, 30% um, represent the uh, Muslim faith and 9% are Catholic in our facilities. For the substance use and mental health, uh, we expand our services. We, we implemented a uh, CBT, which is a cognitive behavior therapy group. Uh, those who uh, do not know, uh, it's pretty much it's an effective treatment modality based upon the principle that, us, um, that our thoughts impacts our behavior. Um, we also hired a new um, substitute counselor. She started this month. Her name is Ms. Sifoni. She's very uh, well diverse in CBT. She speaks fluent Italian and German. Um, grievances. As you guys are aware, in 2003, the request for grievance process was upgraded to include electronic version. Uh, this process significantly improved communication with our population and has proven to expedite that resolution. So during this quarter, uh, we there was 10,343 requests and only 652 turned into grievances, which is a 6.30%, which is really great. Thank you to every single one of uh, the police who are responsive and we respond to the grievance from the case manager to the security staff to the uh, healthcare providers. So before we move on there, yes, Deputy Warden. Yeah. Uh, just on the grievances process, I, I was hoping um, to the extent and, and Warden, I, I'm not sure if this is more appropriate for you or for Deputy Warden Valley, but um, with regards to grievances that are uh, on paper, um, can you talk a little bit about what we're doing there to ensure that there's some sort of, um, I don't know what the right term would be, but um, that there's tracking associated with it and that we can be assured that grievances that are um, put forth, that, that they're actually being addressed and that the person who's providing the grievance gets a prompt response to it. Um, and I guess if, the tablets are a critical part of this, um, how that kind of works its way into the issue. Good question. So even though this is the tablet one, we also, the uh, population has the ability to file a paper grievance. Um, so the grievance starts, it starts with the request for information, doesn't matter if it's paper-based or tablet-based. Uh, the uh, Unless we have emergency grievance in case of something extremely happened. Um, once they file the paper grievance, they put it in the, we have a box, a lock by where they can put the uh, request for information in there. Our um, grievance coordinator uh, picks up the grievance and uh, when she receives it, she timestamps it. And then she provides it um, to, I'm sorry, sorry the, the request for the case manager looks at it, they provide it to the appropriate site. And then if it's not, they have a certain amount of time to respond and then it turns into a grievance. Uh, once it turns to the grievance, the grievance coordinator stamps them that, and then he goes to the supervisor. Um, the supervisor has uh, five business days to respond. Um, and then after that, uh, if they don't respond, it goes to uh, any uh, senior leadership management. And I, I wanted to add in a few things because I think the point is well taken. Uh, so we have a manual spreadsheet that we are tracking the paper grievances. And so when those are date and time stamped, picked up, that's in there, the time officially clocks upon receipt of the uh, the grievance. The challenge that I think that we face is uh, A, that paper is you know no longer ideal uh, because paper goes missing. And that is not always a good answer, but it is a factual answer in terms of human element. Um, and so the electronic grievance is the preferred only because that is date and time stamped electronically. It doesn't magically disappear somewhere from the system, whereas paper could go missing. Paper could get, um, I, I will say, destroyed, misplaced, uh, again, not intentionally, but if water spills or if something happens um, and, and that paperwork goes missing, that's the only record that we are working by. And so I think that we have found most recently that some of the grievances that have not met timeliness have been filed in different manners. So it is handed to a staff person and then that staff person in the course of their duties sets it down 
into a pile of other papers and then later discovers it. And then we have had some time that has elapsed. So we are working to make sure that we educate everybody involved once we identify that these instances still happen to make sure that it is submitted in the box that Deputy Fowley had indicated so that it follows the appropriate procedure and can be tracked in that manner consistently. Um, we're also reminding staff that if somebody hands you a grievance, which you are permitted to do, and that's in our handbook as well, uh, that you take action with that and you get that where it needs to go again so that it can follow the appropriate procedure procedure and timeline. I myself have received them via postal mail, um, which is very interesting, but it does happen. So for whatever reason, the individual decides to send it via that mechanism, um, and that will additionally elongate timelines. So uh, still some challenges. It's within that quality improvement review that we referenced and discussed earlier that none of these processes are perfect, uh, but the people are, are working towards the best of intentions and for being responsive to the requests when they come in. Warden, is there, because I, I hear you, the, and the term I was looking for is chain of custody. So with the chain of custody being more challenging around paper than it is electronic, um, I can understand that it, it's, you know, more challenging. Um, is there, I guess, in terms of the paper that's put into the box, who picks that up? Is it, is it reliant upon perhaps the, the CO who, look, frankly, may be the subject of the grievance? Um, or is there someone from more senior management who uh, is responsible for the chain of custody of that paper to ensure that, again, like a, a CO who may be um, the subject of the grievance um, doesn't have a, a handle in, in whether or not that piece of paper gets to where it's supposed to be? Yeah, so our mailroom staff is the staff that is entrusted to pick up the paperwork and then deliver it where it needs to go. And so that's directly going to our grievance coordinator, um, unless it is handed to somebody by other means. So if it follows the appropriate procedure, the locked boxes have access from the mailroom staff. Mailroom staff will maintain custody of it and get that to the grievance coordinator so it can be followed up on. And so I think- And I guess just- Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Points and just getting that information out there so that it can be reinforced. Uh, when we spoke earlier, just to kind of tie in how important all of these decisions are, uh, the vendor or contract provider for phones or telecommunication, there are some facilities where pods have or blocks have kiosks. So if somebody does or does not have access to a tablet, they could submit something via a kiosk on the site. And again, um, we're not worried about tablet access. We're not worried about uh, paper forms going somewhere. And so that could be something that we include in a future scope uh, or bid to try and again, eliminate, mitigate, or reduce some of the issues that we see with the procedures. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. And would it be something that we could potentially include in, you know, since we just voted to um, bid out the, uh, the telephone services, can we include that in that in that scope of work? We can. I think that would be great. Um, and I guess just my last question here, is it communicated to, um, to inmates that, you know, under our current infrastructure around grievances that the best way to file them is through the tablet so that there's, you know, a paper trail? Um, that it is electric, ironically, a paper trail, that, that, that there is an electronic um, chain of custody for it that is, um, you know, ex expedites its its processing. Is that in the, is that in the handbook or, or is that expressed in some other way? Um, we don't express a preference to the population because they have the right to submit a grievance in whichever manner they deem sufficient. Uh, a lot of people, do want a paper record of things. And so they want that physical piece of paper that, uh, you know, is communicated. It is ideal for us for tracking, but not necessarily maybe the most ideal process. But both options are articulated in the inmate uh, handbook, as well as with, as Deputy Fowley referenced, our case management staff reinforces a lot of this and our correctional staff also inform individuals on how to submit grievances. I had a question. Okay. Thank you. If, are you done, Kevin? I'm sorry. I am. Yep. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I have a question. So my, my question is towards the residents of grievance. Um, so a resident really 
does not get an answer of when his grievance can be heard, or if he does not have an electronic tablet, he won't be able to file an electronic grievance. So I'm just trying to be clear of how that process, I know how it works, but I'm trying to find out how it works um, because I know grievance is a tough situation for the residents and for the jail, right? Because those grievances sometimes don't make it where they're supposed to go. So I'm saying, I'm saying to say that, would the resident be able to be told by someone when his grievance could be heard, especially when you hear a resident saying that he put 10 or 12 grievances in and never have gotten a response? Now, I'm, I'm only saying this from a perspective of being in that resident's shoes um, because I feel like he has no representation, right? So I'm just curious of how that works for um, the people, loved ones that's looking at this meeting right now um, to know that a lot of them call home about being concerned about these grievances. Is, is it worth filing, right? So I think they deserve at least some kind of clarity of what that looks like. Um, I know filing a grievance on someone, especially if it's a white shirt, um, it's tough for a resident. So I'm just curious about the protocol and the process of how that works. Like if I filed a grievance today, um, when would I be heard? Um, when would I be told that it's been received? Um, not even a part of talking about if the if the situation has been resolved according to their investigation, but when will my grievance be heard and have it been um, you know um, act on? I guess that's the word I want to use. So we have timelines that are articulated within the incarcerated person handbook on when a response should be given. Now we had referenced before the challenges that we have in tracking accurately, uh, the dates and times of when that starts. Uh, but they would not necessarily, if they've submitted a grievance, receive an acknowledgement, that's an interesting perspective, that it was received. Um, I don't know if that's redundant. If we are being timely with our response, they should be receiving uh, notice with a full response within you know, 10 days of, of that coming through. And so that should be the timeline. If they're not receiving a response, something happened. And I don't know if we can surmise what happened, mm -hmm. uh, but that there was clearly something that was not followed or that there was an error of some kind. For the tablets, when they submit a grievance, when they log back in to their personalized account, and everybody has an independent identification number that they utilize to sign in, uh, they would be able to see within their messages and notifications what the response to the grievance was. Uh, now we have a grievance coordinator who is an objective individual. She is not a security personnel member who also oversees the process. And so she, multi she, she reviews what's in the tablets, what has or has not been responded to. And when we referenced earlier that it initial step of a request for information, if there isn't a response within five days, it automatically becomes a grievance. So if, even if somebody doesn't have a grievance, but they have a question and we're not answering it, now it becomes a step one grievance. It just automatically escalates. And there are particular groups that are set up within the agency electronically that receive and have to respond to grievances. That is also identified within the handbook. And so if we want to go to that degree of minutia, we certainly can. Uh, but you, your specific question was, what is the population told? How do they know what to do? And so that's where they're finding the information. Uh, we have department heads who have to respond, which might include a unit manager. If it is about a staff conduct issue, so you had referenced a white shirt, that's why we have a grievance coordinator to make sure that she's reading because sometimes people will, will submit grievances that are not actually grievances. It might be, I, I want to kill myself, you know, and that's what they're sending through or I'm having chest pains and I need somebody to see me. And, and so we have somebody who does an initial review or triage of what's coming through to make sure it's assigned in the right area. And if it needs to go elsewhere, it will. So if it's one of those items, like a more emergency, 
urgent healthcare need, that's immediately going to be notified to their shift commander as well as our healthcare staff. And so that is a broad level. Um, we could certainly go into a lot of different specifics related to this topic. But um, again, so much more easy to manage within that electronic process because the timelines are built in for us. Things turn automatically to a grievance from a request from information if we are not meeting a timeline. And then if the employee chooses to appeal, so a step one grievance that they do not agree or appreciate or feel that the response was just or comprehensive, they can escalate that to a step two grievance. Um, the other thing that you had referenced earlier is when when would they be heard? And so I just wanna make sure that they're, we're not misrepresenting. We don't call incarcerated individuals to physically hear their grievance as you would in a labor proceeding. Um, this is just something that they're submitting for review and a response is investigated and articulated back to them. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So um, what, I just have one announcement. Um, we we'll didn't talk about the first one. On uh, April 27, we'll have a volunteer service orientation uh, for new pro stakeholders. So um, your um, the administrators, your religious service, Reverend Chaplain will reach out to anyone that's approved. Um, just put it on your calendar so for April 27th for your new orientation. Before I pass it to Ms. Shaw, for, um, Administrator Shaw, do you guys have any questions for me? Good evening, members of the board and the public. I will be sharing program and reentry updates from the month of March. On Tuesday, March 26, we connected with Director Colonel Jenkins and the Delaware County Veterans and Military Affairs Department to enroll veterans in the Veterans Employment Project. The Veterans Employment Project seeks to aid justice-involved veterans, recently incarcerated veterans, and their spouses in obtaining training for part-time or full-time employment or educational programs. And again, it's important to highlight that the service is also available to the spouses of the veterans. Additionally, resources for supportive services including housing and recovery, mental health support will be available through partnerships with housing recovery and mental health partners. The Veterans Employment Project is collaborating with the Delaware County Workforce Development Board, veterans court judges, prosecutors, public defenders, probation and parole, and George, George W. Hill with the goal of stabilizing the lives of Delaware County veterans while building toward full-time employment. Moving forward, the Delaware County Veterans and Military Affairs Department staff will be on site bi-weekly to provide one-on-one -on -one sessions with our veteran population to promote the Veteran Employment Project, answer any questions, and address any concern. In the month of March, five veterans engaged with the Veterans Department. One out of the five has since been released and already followed up with the Veterans Department. This is very encouraging as often follow-up follow service upon release can be a challenge. And in the photo on the slide, we have Director Colonel Jenkins and his associate, Jennifer Needle, and a few of our staff veterans, Major Pleasant, Officer Watkins, Sergeant Coleman, Records Supervisor Meyer, Records Tech Palm, and Sergeant Banks. And again, we have many other veterans. These were just a few that were available for a photo. Lastly, to any justice-involved veterans who may be listening, please reach out to the Delaware County Veterans and Military Affairs Department. Director Colonel and his staff can be reached at 484-460-1574 or utilize the Del Delaware County website to learn more. Last month, we went in depth about the First Step Vocational Program. For any new viewers tuning in, EDSI facilitates the First Step program 
which is a four week workshop that teaches foundational skills, job readiness, employability, digital literacy, and job search strategies. And upon release, aligns participants with job interviews. The first step cohort 12 concluded in March and we had our highest number of successful completions, eight. And we started the cohort with 11 bringing the total number of completions to 58. Last month, I failed to mention that since the first step implementation, 96 individuals met the program eligibility, signed up for the class and participated in the program on some level. However, they either withdrew from the class or did not meet the minimal work requirements. And in summary, 96, individuals thus far enrolled in the program and 58 have successfully completed the program. And lastly, as a result of last month's board approval, the Delaware County Workforce Development Board officially submitted the one-year grant extension at no cost request, which would continue services until June 30th of 2025. Lastly, highlighted are our community-based organization reentry program participation numbers. Thresholds had eight participants. The Boys Council, which is our juvenile program, had three participants. Maternity Care Coalition served three participants. Widener University facilitated a financial literacy workshop with 14 participants and the Delaware County Reentry Program is serving 10 participants. Thank you. Can I answer any questions? No, just no questions for me, but just um, excited to see these programs continuing to move forward. Thank you both deputy wardens. Thank you for the warden and deputy warden report. Is there any new business? Okay, is there any public comment? Any general public comment? Please step forward, state your name, municipality, and you have three minutes. The timer is on the screen. Uh, good evening, I'm Robert Ciccinelli. I live in Havertown. I'm here on behalf of Delco Coalition for Prison Reform. And um, you each found a little gift from us at your seats tonight. Um, what seems like many years ago, the citizens of Delaware County organized to take a hard look at the conditions inside the George W. Hill Correctional Facility. We formed Delco CPR, and our role, sole campaign was to improve the quality of life of the people housed in the jail. To be fair, GEO had set the bar very, very low. Um, and so the first step for us was the campaign to deprivatize the jail. When that became a reality two years ago, our mission morphed into ensuring that all the reforms we that we saw as necessary would also come to pass. So today we provide you with our assessment on these important goals 24 months later. Clearly we see the progress. Uh, we also see where improvement still needs to happen. And if I may borrow from Chairman Madden's earlier statement, um, we believe the George W. Hill facility could be the prototype for county corrections across Pennsylvania. Um, this report that you've received tonight uh, would not be possible without the amazing transparency that has developed in the last few years. Um, we're also very grateful to Warden Williams because she provided a lot of input and references to us as we uh, were writing the report. We hope our conclusions are informative and will help guide the current and future efforts. And we look forward to progress over the next year. Thank you. Other public comment? Kimberly Brown, Cobwin, Pennsylvania. First thing I want to say that I've been to several meetings this board meeting and county council meeting, and I'm not sure if people are aware of the 
the Sunshine Act, and I never had to sign in during a meeting. And I didn't want to sign in during a meeting because you don't have to sign in a meeting. And somehow my name was signed in for the meeting. I'm a new case manager at George W. Hill. And as a case manager, recidivism is not, is, it needs to be stopped. And it cannot be stopped if we, if the prison doesn't have more, more reentry programs. The programs that were just listed, it should be more inmates participated in those programs. We need more for men that want to change their lives completely around. They need help with resumes. They want to make it sure they can get a job once they get out. I'm on the general population unit and you have a lot of IP that's about to be released to the streets. Since I've been here for four months, I've been seeing two people come back and it's very shocking. So would the prison need more reentry programs? As you can see, the wellness instructor been posted on the website for over a year now. There's one reentry case manager, but she's under case management. We have one librarian and we have a reentry administrator that's getting paid salary. So we have a department that's empty, but we have a leader in the department, which we need more programs. We need more programs. And the tablets, we gotta figure out the tablet situation. Last but not least, the jail does not have any power, I mean, any connection for the tablets and the phones. Tomorrow's commissary day, and there's short staff of COs. And if the inmates cannot pay for the commissary tomorrow, I'll be afraid because I don't want no one coming to my office trying to get to my phone and being upset. There's a shortage of officers and we need help. We got to figure out how can we keep these officers. Thank you. Any final public comment? Any board member comments? I just want to say, um, I want to thank CPR for the report. I haven't had a chance to go through it. Um, I know there was a lot of community engagement and support to towards the deprivatization. And I just want to remind when, when Mr. Madden and I arrived here in 2018, it was about the first thing on my pile was the geo contract and it's taken a lot of work and effort by everybody but I can't minimize the input from the community so um thank you for that I, I do need to go through it and if we have questions I'm sure we might and um but thank you for that input I'd like to thank um the the report that we have gotten today in reference to the prison and especially um Mr. Ciccinelli, you know, um, being here in the beginning when we try to make this change. And, um, you know, all of the staff come to be transparent. I, I like to, I, I appreciate um, the comment that the young lady made. Um, it's not easy to come up on that mic and make a comment such as hers, and she works at the prison. Um, sometimes, you know, um, <laughs> the sun ain't always shining outside. It rains sometimes. You know, and I appreciate the fact that she comes here with a perspective as well of what's going on inside the prison that we oversee and the one that she works in. Um, I, I just, I, I love and respect um, all perspectives from everything. It gives us a, a greater idea of what, we, what work we have ahead of us and what we need to do. Um, so the residents and the people that work there, like I've been saying since I've been on this board for all these years, um, it, that relationship makes the institution better. Um, so I really appreciate that. I appreciate people's honesty um, and I appreciate their transparency because that's, I think transparency is one of the ingredients of success for any partnership that we have to help people in Delaware County. So I think this meeting today um, was important to me um, I got on this board because I wanted to help and I will continue to be a truth teller and help and, um, to make sure that things get better for our prison here at Delaware County. 
Um, I'd like to echo the thanks of my fellow board members toward the Coalition for Prison Reform. Um, I, I think, you know, it, it's such an important role that the organization takes. I think having the professionalism of their leadership and the group at large to be that outside resource that brings a different set of eyes to, um, to what we're doing every single day. Uh, and, and look, I think balancing appropriately urgency for creating the institution that we all envision for Delaware County, balancing that with an also appropriate understanding of the challenges that we face, right? That we can't wave a magic wand and look for $40 million of catch up capital projects to just suddenly occur. Um, we don't live in a world that's unconstrained from capital challenges. We could, you know, spend all the money in the world and try to fill every single vacancy in order to do so. Um, but that means a major impact to the taxpayer and not one probably that they would be very welcoming of. So um, I think, you know, and, and lastly, you know, as, as we talked about before, um, you inherit an institution that already exists. This isn't standing up something up from scratch. Um, there may be expectations of how things occurred in the past that don't suddenly transform. Um, it takes some time to shift culture. It takes some time to shift expectations about accountability and, um, and standards of work. Uh, and so, again, I think it's important, and I think CPR really does this, balancing um, that appropriate sense of urgency with an appropriate understanding of the challenges that we face that stand in the way of making everything that we like occur tomorrow. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Bob, and thank you for the rest of their leadership um, for your, your efforts over these last several years. As mentioned earlier, I also want to thank the President Judge Cartesano for hosting a meeting again with uh, Daniel Hibbard and the warden to discuss data and looking forward to uh, further collaboration uh, on understanding our data and understanding our numbers and what they mean and how they can help us better serve our populations. Um, I also want to thank the warden for hosting us on our unannounced uh, oversight board visit, and it does in fact, take courage to speak um, to people, whether it's an incarcerated person or staff, it takes courage to speak to authorities and tell your truth and your story. So I genuinely thank everybody that spoke with us on that visit to share their experience with us. And we did take every, um, we did take every comment to heart and listened and are gonna do our best to uh, collate that into a meaningful report that we can uh, take action on. And I know we're looking forward to seeing that report and sharing that report and making any improvements that we can from the information that was shared. And finally, I don't think we repeated this, but if I am, that's okay. Uh, congratulating again, the George W. Hill staff, every one of them for getting a nice uh, report report from the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections uh, on their annual inspection a report of no deficiencies um, and also being able to uh, be on a two-year cycle this time so they would not be back for two years. That obviously takes a lot of work and it is a great achievement, um, particularly considering where we've been and where we've come. So thanks again to every single staff person there at the facility and the warden for making that happen. Um, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. In favor? Aye. 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 Good evening, everyone. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.